a newly formed organisation called the New Zealand Federation of Social Society. So there's a um, our sister, our big sister society, which um, is Canterbury Social Society, which our speaker tonight, Shannon, is from. She's also an executive member of that. They started in 2017. 2017 have been going since then, and then Wellington is the second society start up, and now we have two more affiliates in Hamilton and Otago, and at the moment we are 110 members, I think. I want to say it's 112. Oh, yeah. Whoa, so 112, we're getting up there, so it's, it's great. So Canterbury is about 60, Wellington's got about 25, Otago 10, Hamilton 10, we have a few members at large as well, but um, primary goal is mostly educational, so we hold monthly public talks such as this, um, movies as well. We do a couple of reading clubs, um, or book clubs we've got running. Um, do public uh, or open social drinks as well once a month, so it's a fairly um, low bar of entry when it comes to sort of education around socials. And we don't need to do much, just need to turn up and have a drink and listen really. Um, we have, met, like, so we have all of our um, events uh, open to the public. We do have members who basically, I think it's about 30 bucks a year, and when you sign up you get uh, a book from, uh, that was published by Canterbury Social Society, was a Marx pamphlet that they've republished called the Canterbury, not called the Canterbury, um, called Wage, Labour and Capital, you get a little fancy yeah, lapel like there, yeah. <laughs> yeah. and, um, and yeah, it just helps us sort of keep these sort of things going along really, but um, tonight's talk is on, as we can see here, matter myth and memory. Um, so Shannon has just finished her PhD in English Literature on Magical Realism. Um, I've never known, <laughs> I, I don't really know what Magical Realism is, I had to Google it and they said Green Mile is a Magical Realism movie, so if you can think of what that is, <laughs> that is what um, Shannon's PhD was on. But um, tonight I think her lecture is sort of tying in post-colonial literature, it's sort of um, relationship to Marxism, the kind of similarities, the differences where and sort of um, yeah, how we kind of got to where we are in the sort of that uh, area of literature. Um, but without further ado, I'm going to hand things over. Oh, actually, no, something before the further ado. Um, tonight we have Taylor looking after us from Bedlam and Scholar, so we thank you very much. We can give her a quick round of applause. Yeah. <laughs> Bedlam and Scholar is where we host every event, and we are very um, appreciative of everything they do to help us sort of build the foundation that we have. Um, but there's toilets just behind the bar there, there's one exit, one entry, so if there is a fire and earthquake, I don't really know, run. <laughs> We're all adults, we know what to do. Um, but um, form a single file and get out of the building. But yeah, other than that, I'm going to pass it on to Shannon. Thank you. I just don't really want to spend the next wee while holding this, so I just need to make sure that it's comfortable for me. Thank you so much for having me. Um, so my name is Shannon Burns. I'm a member of the Canterbury Socialist Society. And again, I just wanted to say thanks to the Wellington Socialist Society and also to the people at Bedlam and Squalor for hosting us. I'm really excited to be here and thank you all for coming out tonight. Um, so, I am part of the Canterbury Socialist Society. Um, I also host our monthly radio show slash podcast, which this is a shameless kind of plug for actually what is a local access radio show in Canterbury, but you are able to access it at plainsofhim.org.nz. Um, and our latest episode came yesterday, in which I interviewed Duncan Webb of the Labour Party uh, and sort of had fun with him, so that's good if you're interested in kind of thinking about what might be going on in the action year of the election cycle, you might want to check it out. So cool. Um, so I currently work as a learning specialist at Christchurch City Libraries, um, and I've been there for just over a year, but prior to that, I graduated with a PhD in English Literature from the University of Canterbury. So I haven't really just finished, in fact I'm in that awkward time where I'm like, what am I doing with this stuff? Um, and what I'm doing today is telling you a little bit about it. Um, Cool, okay. So I suppose you could say if I had any areas of expertise, they are kind of post-colonial literature, the new materialisms, which are really about theorising um, the agency of non-human matter, uh, and also feminism and gender studies, and there's some interplay between feminism and gender studies and the new materialisms as well, which I'll be happy to um, talk about. 
if there are questions or if there will be a later, I'm not sure I'm going to get to a whole lot of stuff tonight. Um, I will do my best in about half an hour. Um, but more specifically, my PhD thesis was titled, or is titled, Matter, Memory, Myth, Recasting Magical Realism. And in it, I argue against dominant accounts of magical realism, uh, which you may or may not have encountered. Does anyone want to put your hand up if you have ever heard of magical realism before? Like quite a few people, that's good. And I don't know if that's actually a good thing for you or not. It could be, there are like two bits that I always mention when I'm talking about magical realism. And so it's the opening shot of Narcos, the TV program, where it's like, there's a reason why Colombia is the place where magical realism originated. Do -do. Now we're gonna talk about Pablo Escobar. Or there's Peep Show, where Jeremy is just being a really like greasy guy to a lady <laughs> and they're in a bookstore and he's like, oh yeah, I'd really like to be part of your book group. And she's like, we're actually reading some magical realism. And he's like, oh, I love that. And she's like, I knew you were in tune with your feminine side. So it's kind of been memeified a little bit as popular and kind of fluffy, quite exotic as well. So if you've encountered it in literature, you might have read authors like Gabriel Garcia Marquez is a big one, Isabella Allende, maybe Jose Saramago is a Portuguese author. Um, there are lots and particularly more so recently in the African continent um, in African American and Native American writers. Um, if you've encountered it, you know, just generally, um, you might not know as much, but um, authors like Gunter Grass, who is a German writer as well, maybe Milan Kundera is pretty popular, some people might have heard of him, and also people like Mikhail Bulgakov, writing under um, the Soviet Union as well. So it's actually really prolific and widespread in the 20th century, but really territorialized in Central and South America. So I'm gonna hopefully maybe talk a little bit about why that is. But yeah, I really love magical realism, so I hope some of the people who put their hands up will be like, I'm here for this and not, because I'm like, yeah, I just wanted to tune into my feminine side. <laughs> but that's okay too as well, if you wanted to. Um, <laughs> so in particular, in my thesis, as I said, um, I argued against dominant accounts of magical realism, which are also dominant accounts of post-colonial literature and politics. And so I'm going to have a little bit to say about those things and how they came about, why we have the kind of assumptions that we have about what it means to be post-colonial and what would be important um, to post-colonial authors and activists. Um, but also really I was writing for a particular way of reading magical realism, post-colonial um, fiction, and also our kind of political praxis in the world's, world now. Um, and that really all centers on looking at the interplay of historical matter and vibrant matter. And again, what I mean by that um, is, I'm gonna be talking a bit about historical material conditions, so the stuff of modernity or post-modernity as it might be now, the kind of like concrete is not always a good word, but the physical kind of stuff that we live with every day, um, that also has a kind of agency of its own. Um, and can react in unlikely ways, and that's really the story of magical realism. I hope that this will come to be a little bit more familiar over the course of the talk, um, but we'll see how we go. And I'm really like happy to take any questions at any point as well, because it's been a little bit of time working full time since I've engaged really fully with this material. Um, so I'm really happy to be doing it again, and it's really nice to just be back in the headspace. So if you have any questions at all, that's totally cool. Um, so what I will say just before I get started is that this picture is a really important picture to me and I'm not really going to talk about it until right at the end of this talk, um, but this is a picture of the statue of the Virgin Mary in the northern tower of the Christchurch Catholic Basilica. Um, and so in the February 2011 earthquake, which was um, actually the lesser of the earthquakes but the more damaging one <laughs> in terms of infrastructure and life, um, this statue, which had been facing inwards inside of the basilica, was so moved um, as to turn around 180 degrees to kind of stare out at the wreckage upon wreckage of the city. Um, and that's a kind of reference to Walter Benjamin um, in the Angel of History, sort of looking out upon the state of the world. Um, and this is a real, I think to me, indicative thing of the way that magical realism works, which is when matter, um, non-human matter, kind of works in a way where it suggests a reading of itself that kind of, I guess, interrupts the way that we normally read matter around us. And that's really the story. So we'll see how we go. <laughs> 
So what I'm going to do, let's, is this the laptop I'm using? It is. Oh, I'm not even in this. Awkward. How can I make this move to the next slide? Oh, down. That's cool. <laughs> um, so what I'm going to talk about is, in fact, magical realism, which people might know um, primarily through literature, is kind of made up as a historical tradition through three movements. Oh, no, I didn't do it. Sorry. I did see a little nod and I was like, what's that one? <laughs> um, so the first one is called Magashar Realismus or Magic Realism. Oh, it's a cross. That's cool. We'll get there. Um, which is the style of painting that originates in the Weimar Republic in the 1920s and 30s. And then I'm going to talk about um, marvellous realism, or the real marvelioso, um, a classic South Island pronunciation there, um, which is kind of a cosmological framework, um, and it's where magical realism find its root, finds its roots in Central and South America. I'll talk a little bit about magical realism, which is kind of the formalisation of magical realism as a literary mode or a genre, um, and one that is particularly um, popular and um, commercially popular uh, as well. And I'm going to talk about the post-colonial unconscious, which is actually a work by a guy called Neil Lazarus uh, from 2011. He's a Marxist or materialist critic of post-colonial studies who kind of intervenes in some of the dominant accounts of post-colonial li literature and politics. Um, and so I'm going to use him to talk about why we think of magical realism in the way that we do and not other ways. And ultimately what I really want to say <laughs> in this talk um, is that the story of magical realism is sort of like one or the other, this kind of dialectic in ways between um, something that's really subversive um, and something that is a kind of heroic realism that can be co-opted very easily um, by our state and by structures of power. And in either case, we get this kind of tension between a tendency to remember through matter, through the stuff around us, and to see the legacy of how historical modes of production have functioned, um, or to forget to mythologize where things have come from. And I also think that that corresponds to a kind of tension or a dialectic between what I'm gonna call solidarity and solitude. And I've actually kind of stolen um, that parallel from Gabriel Garcia Marquez as well, from his, um, Nobel Prize winning speech. Um, so for him, solidarity is to be able to share a common ground, a common world, materially with people all over the world, as opposed to solitude, which is kind of, I guess, um, when un unintelligibility uh, gets to a point where you are no longer able to actually find any any way of expressing your experiences to people, and therefore, you know, what what's the future? There is no matter, there is no history there is no future, that kind of stuff. And so I'm just going to talk about how I found it useful to kind of combine and recombine old and new materialisms. And so my something old, something new is a lovely little like marriage, um, a play uh, on the marriage of feminism and Marxism as well. So if anything, I think I'm probably going to give you more things to read than ever tonight. <laughs> um, but I actually think that's good. Um, so yeah, no, I have to go across. Oh no, I will get this, Hayden, don't worry. It's not across, it's not down. Can you help me? I won't make you do this for every slide and everyone here, I'm really sorry. <laughs> got too many laptops going, it's actually very stressful, but it's all right. So what I'm just gonna do is ask, so people, now it's down, so that's good. This is, you know, it's matter, it's working with waves and the color. And it's, it's the hammer that doesn't work, that kind of stuff. The well-wrought broken hammer is a Graham Huggins who does object-oriented ontology. There's one for you to read. <laughs> um, but basically what I want to do is just give you a really basic working account or definition of what magical realism does in literature. And then I'm going to kind of rehistoricize that. I'm sorry if I'm standing in the way of that for you. <laughs> sorry about that. So this is a woman called Wendy Ferris, who is one of the, I guess, like more preeminent um, scholars of magical realism. This is a 2004 work called Ordinary Enchantments. And she sort of lists a couple of characteristics that are kind of indicative of magical realism in literature. 
And so she says, first the text, whatever it is, will contain an irreducible element of magic. And what she means by irreducible is that there's no sort of funny explanation for it. It's not conjuring magic, it can't be something that you wake up and it was all just a dream, <laughs> um, or there was some sort of, yeah, um, um, trick or whatever like that. It is just magic, and it just occurs, and it's just part of the world. So for example, if you've read 100 Years of Solitude, by Gabriel Garcia Marquez. There are so many instances in there, but one of them will be when um, Jose Arcadio, one of the sons is killed, and his mother's sort of like, what's happened to him? I've got a bad vibe. He's shot and his blood sort of tracks the whole way through the city in a droplet, just like going, just so through like Google Maps <laughs> to his mum Ursula to be able to find her. And in that, we also get the second element here of magical realism in literature, which is that it details a strong presence of the phenomenal world. So always, there will be a lot of attention to architecture, a lot of lists about what is there, what the space looks like, a lot of sensory detail. If you know Life of Pi <laughs> is another quite famous one. On the boat, we get a real inventory of all the life supplies that are there. Um, there's, you know, X amount of cans of water and so many biscuits and stuff like that as well. So a real sense that this is realistic in lots of different ways. And this element of magic is just as realistic. Okay, this third one I have a little bit of a problem with, but it is kind of one to keep in the back of your mind. So the idea that the reader will experience some kind of discomfort or an unsettling doubt in their effort to reconcile two contradictory understandings of events. And usually that is the real and the unreal. Um, and oftentimes that comes to actually mean maybe the indigenous or the colonizers perspective, as we'll come and see. Um, but a way to reconcile it is the bit that I have a little bit of an issue with because I think magical realism deliberately kind of doesn't reconcile things at times. It, it leaves that dialectic kind of open. Um, at times, in some works, like Isabella Allende's The House of the Spirits, and even more so uh, in a woman called Laura Esquivel, who worked like Water for Chocolate, that dialectic is resolved, and it is so really problematically and in line with neoliberalism in the third way. <laughs> so that's something I'm not really going to get a chance to talk about tonight, but just to say that that's why I have some reservations around that. <sighs> I just need to have a breath. <laughs> okay, so what I'm going to do is just now kind of this is true, this is fine, um, this is a good working understanding, but it comes from somewhere and it says some things about what magical realism does um, and it overlooks other things that magical realism equally does, <laughs> you know, and quite well and that are really fundamental to it. And so I just want to rehistoricize the tradition a little bit. In fact, as I'll come to show, this is a tradition that didn't really come to international consciousness until, I guess, the 70s, maybe the 80s. Um, and that was after a lot of lag in the translation of books that were in other languages. Um, and there was then a desire to go back and find where this had, tradition had come from. And so there was already a kind of bias there in looking for the strands that made up this particular moment, or as some people call it, the maturation of Central and South America, which is the most condescending thing ever. But, you know, the way that... Um, you know, the post-colonial moment, I guess, in literature. So I just want to start a little bit before that and kind of lead back up to how we got there. So in the 1920s and 30s, in the Weimar Republic, which is what the, I guess, the contemporary state of Germany now would be known as, so it's sort of 1918, 19 to 1933, um, a style of painting emerged called Magasha Realismus, or Magic Realism, or Post-Expressionism. And that was identified by a German art critic and historian called Franz Rowe. And so this was a really volatile period in history. Obviously, it's between the two world wars. Um, we've got a, a lot of just stuff to do with modernity. So lots of industrialization, rapid urbanization. Uh, we've also got um, the sense of all the possibilities of what modernization has given to us, but also the perils after the First World War, and some real fear about what's coming with the next one as well. Politically, really divisive time, of course, so we've got really extreme, extreme stuff happening on the right and the left. It's also a time 
in which the reparations imposed on Germany after the First World War uh, lead to hyperinflation. So you have the sense of there being a real, like, you know, things not being proportionate, um, really improbable kind of, I, I guess, dimensions to the world, things feeling both real and unreal. And so in this moment, um, particularly surrealism as a form of art became really popular. And surrealism was all about trying to actualize on a canvas a psychological landscape that didn't necessarily exist in the real world and to find uh, maybe a reason somewhere in the subconscious or whatever for what was happening in the world, the kind of the perils and the progress um, to sort of do that. And what magic realism as a style of painting did was rather than look internally into the mind to see like what's going on subconsciously, all this kind of stuff, it looked to the most basic, most mundane, most ordinary matter that existed just in the world and in the cities in which people were living. And so it looked at machines, industrial machines, turbines were really big, railroads as you'll come to see in a moment as well. Um, just its cityscapes, the most normal material landscapes that people were living in now, to see that if you focused on them, you know, in pastel colours in a way that felt quite quiet and serene, would you be able to see something more in that matter than people were seeing normally? Would there be some kind of answer in the stuff that we already have and live with that would tell us about how things came to be as they are? and what's going to happen next, because that was really an anxiety that was happening there. And so in a 1925 essay, no, oh. <laughs> is it sideways now? No, it's not working. In a 1925 essay called um, Magic Realism Post-Expressionism, I'm so sorry, I feel like this is my fault, but that's okay. Um, Franz Rowe sort of delineates this style for the first time. Um, I'm just going to reopen the PowerPoint, that's all good. Just take this moment to have a little drink, have a breath. I don't know if you need to have a breath, but I do. Perfect, yes. So, um, side, okay, so he says, the phases of all art <laughs> can be distinguished quite simply by means of the particular objects that artists perceive among all the objects in the world thanks to an act of selection that is already an act of creation. And so what Franz Rowe was saying is that there is so much emphasis here on in the normal kind of art or you know, the kind of fervour of expressionism that had preceded this moment um, to pick really uh, intense kind of uh, material and content to display. And magic realism, through its act of selecting just the most mundane um, of objects, the things that real people, you know, working people encountered every day, through that selection, it chose to kind of also create the world as well. And so what it did, I should have said as well, is it's not just kind of pastel colours and kind of a stillness and stuff like that as well. Everything in magic realist painting is real, all the objects, unlike surrealism. But they're configured in such a way that you would think, I wouldn't expect to have that with that or that's a weird line of sight. I wouldn't have expected to see that part of the building and also, <laughs> you know, that as well. So it feels a little bit uncanny. It's the kind of unheimlichkeit or un uncanniness um, that was something that artists were looking to kind of emphasize at that time. Um, but nothing in it is unreal. It's all real and it's all just a matter of recombination rather than reinvention. Um, so that's, that's kind of a thing. And again here, this is Irene Gunter um, writing in, I guess, one of the, the more important works for magical realist literary criticism. It's called uh, Magic Realism Theory, History, Community. And I always get that wrong because the history is second, which tells you how much they care about history. <laughs> theory first. Um, but she says, clearly it was not the subject matter, the cityscapes, you know, the turbines, the machines, whatever, that made this art so different. Rather, it was the fastidious depiction of familiar objects in a new way of seeing and rendering the everyday. And so, I'll just give you one example. Sideways. Yes. <laughs> Amazing. Um, so, this is Jörg Skrip. Uh, this is 1931, I believe, and it's called Bahn Übergang, or Railroad Crossing. 
And this is an example of magic realism or post-expressionism. It's very kind of calm, it's got those pastel colours, it has got some weird sort of angles um, that are going on there. But I think as well, and I would love to have included more examples than I can do like virtually somehow after this, that the whole point of magic realist painting was to depict things that make you think like, what is the point of this? What is the point of a railroad when there's no train on it? Or where is this going? What is the point of a turbine if it's still and not moving? Um, what is the point of a toll booth? Again, all this kind of stuff, all these um, innovations and wondering to what end were they going? Was it to this progress that modernity had promised? Or, you know, unfortunately, is it to something like this? And, you know, spoiler, this is Auschwitz. Um, but you can see that there was a real sense of like not really knowing what this technolog technology is bringing to us. Again, that dialectic of modernity that I'm sure some of you have read about before. So in Magic Realist Painting, that is a real tension. Initially, Magic Realist Painting was practiced by artists on the left. And so I'll just have to look at my notes to get this right. Um, goodness, I can't even read it now, but the German um, group of revolutionary artists and the Red Group as well um, in the Weimar Republic were practitioners of Magic Realist Painting, and they believed that it was a work of the people that would bring art to the people, you know, to replace a kind of sentimentality with something that was actually more um, relevant to working people. Um, but it did come to be co-opted by the Nazi party because, as a kind of heroic realism, again, because it seemed to show, oh, look at this pristine natural environment where our beautiful, like, blood and soil, like, machines are just working so well because we've got it all right with our perfect system of Aryan people. Do you know what I mean? So there was, there's always, and this is what I want to emphasise, and as I'll go through these particular movements, always a tension in magical realism between a desire to demythologize modes of production and historical material conditions to understand where things came from, the infrastructure and the stuff around us, and then also for it to be a kind of mythological force um, that sort of naturalizes um, the world as it is now, particularly under capitalism. It's kind of where I'm going with this. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I hope that's okay so far. We'll see. <laughs> Sideways. Okay. Um, so the second movement, and if this feels jarring to you, I hope so, because this is the account, and you know, dominant accounts of magical realism, there's actually not much of a coherent kind of uh, history that links these three discrete movements together, uh, and that's something that I'm going to address in a bit. Um, but so far, so fine. Okay, Magisha Realismos, we're moving on to low real, maravilloso, or marvellous realism. And so we had the 1920s and the 30s. Marvellous realism is something that originates in Central and South America in the 1940s and 50s. And it's a cosmological approach to the world. It has nothing to do with literature or art at this point in time. It's how it is to be in the world and see the world. Um, and it's usually, by um, critics of magical realism, associated with two particular individuals, so Alejo Carpentier, was a Cuban musicologist and art critic um, who would have been in similar circles as France Rowe, particularly in Paris, um, and also Jorge Louis Borges, um, who a lot of people will have heard of, I'm sure, um, a writer, Argentinian writer um, of various things. <laughs> um, and so that's quite an unsatisfying, as far as I'm concerned, like account of how all of a sudden this thing kind of dipped down and then popped up again in Latin America because two guys thought of it out of their head and like that was cool. What that fails to account for is the fact that actually the huge exodus of exiles from the Third Reich into Central and South America for one, but also again um, the real kind of uh, cultural exchange that was happening through literature and art um, in Europe and Central and South America in the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s. Anyway, <laughs> that's a kind of sidebar. So, marvellous realism is associated with, you know, more so Alejo Carpentier, uh, who was often charged as being a cultural nationalist and for, for the first time, territorialising the marvellous, 
or magical realism, or whatever you want to call it, in Latin America. And this is really the roots of where we get that kind of connection between magical realism and magical stuff in literature in Central and South America. So this is Zamora and Ferris, and they say, in Latin America, Carpentier argues, the fantastic is not to be discovered by subverting or transcending reality with abstract forms and manufactured combinations of images. Rather, the fantastic inheres in the natural and human realities of time and place, where improbable juxtapositions and marvellous mixtures exist by virtue of Latin America's varied history, geography, demography, and politics, not by manifesto. And really what's going on here is that Carpentier did suggest that, as he called them, <laughs> when the dream technicians try to will the marvellous into existence, they become bureaucrats. So he did think that people, particularly who practice surrealism in art, because he was an art critic, that when they tried to sort of fabricate these crazy, like, oh, thought experiments, that that was just like a kind of hackish way of doing stuff, where actually, you know, if you lived, for example, in Central or South America, those kind of crazy juxtapositions or marvellous mixtures were actually just inherent in the world by virtue of the diversity there in terms of, you know, architecture, uh, literature, all that kind of stuff. Unfortunately, the way that Carpentier is reading criticism is that he says the marvellous can only exist in Central and South America because he also did have some stuff around cultural nationalism. And there's a real tension there, I'm not going to answer it or deal with it tonight, um, particularly one for socialists, that, you know, if you want to think about it. We would tend to be really anti-nationalist, of course, and internationalist. Post-colonial nationalism historically has been quite a different beast, and actually what it has been is a step towards being able to participate uh, internationally. It's very hard to do that when you haven't had a nation in the first place and an identity as well. And so oftentimes, post-colonial nationalism, yeah, ha has kind of been different to what we would expect, you know, as socialists. That's just a little sidebar and a thought for people to consider, I guess, in their own time. Um, but yeah, the upshot is that Carpentier is perceived to be a person who said, well, in Europe, uh, you can try and make stuff magical and marvellous, but it's always just a thought experiment. It's always you trying to make things you know, like that, whereas in Latin America, it just is like that. Again, it's a selective reading of what Carpentier had to say. Um, so for example, this is a quote taken from a 1949 essay called On the Marvelous Real in America, <laughs> but where he goes on to talk about the Soviet Union. Um, so he says, I found myself in the Soviet Union, where despite my inability to speak the language, my sense of incomprehension was entirely alleviated. I knew those columns. I knew those astragals. I don't really know how to say that, but it's a wooden bit on a door. In Leningrad, in Moscow, I found once again in the architecture, in the literature, in the theater, a perfectly intelligible universe. Intelligible despite my own deficiencies in technical and mechanical understanding of what is situated outside my own cultural territory. So I think it's very clear from that and other um, things that I've read of Carpentier, uh, that he did not believe that the marvelous or magical realism was territorialized in any one place, just that it couldn't be willed into existence. That again, it was a product of specific historical material conditions where things came together as they did in magic realist painting in such a way, objects, you know, architectural or whatever, to ask the question of why are things like this? Why is this here? That is uncanny. That feels like it shouldn't be here. That's strange, and yet it is. It's a rational thing. We can see how it's come to be here, but it shouldn't be. It defies rationality. It's both real and unreal. So this is kind of the through thread that I'm arguing connects all of the parts of magical realism. So because um, Alejo Carpentier was Cuban. He actually wrote an incredible novel called The Kingdom of This World, which I highly recommend, which is actually about the Haitian Revolution. Um, and it's about the fact that uh, this was the biggest slave revolt in history, um, after which the revolutionaries instituted a system of corvée or forced labour, 
uh, so that former slaves who had been liberated were asked to come back onto plantations and work as non-slaves, <laughs> still for free for the nation. Um, and the moral of that story is that once, um, in this case, uh, a society and economy has been capitalised, it could be another thing if we're talking about, I don't know, Soviet Union or whatever your thoughts are about that, um, it's very hard for, you know, it doesn't really matter if it's, this is his, his words, um, mulatto people or, you know, the black Haitians or whatever, he talks about how their situation of forced labour has remained the same because of the, the mode of production. Um, so that's kind of by the by as well, a really um, good historical materialist book. But it also talks about Henri Christophe, who was one of the revolutionaries who ended up getting um, mortared into his own fortress, uh, the Citadel La Feria. So again, highly recommended if we want to get any ideas for the future. Um, <laughs> incidentally, the one criticism of him is that he's not Haitian <laughs> um, in post-colonial literature. He's Cuban. Um, and so why has he written this incredibly good novel uh, about the plight of slaves? Um, because that's not really his story to tell. And I think that's a really uncomfortable criticism for me personally. Anyway, where am I going with this? Carpentier was actually a cooler guy than a lot of people say. He had more in common with Borges than what people say as well. Borges wrote a really cool um, essay called um, On the Argentine Tradition, where he talks about not having to um, emulate, emulate the cultural flair in order, order to be like legitimately Argentine as well. So yeah, the territorialization of magical realism did not occur at this point is all I'm gonna say. But having written novels and having, to, having started having a literary tradition in Central and South America that talked about marvelous realism, magical realism, um, a kind of, uh, I guess, a moment developed uh, that really kind of culminated, at least for the international reading community, in the publication in 1967 of Gabriel Garcia Marquez's 100 Years of Solitude, um, which won a Nobel Prize in 1972. <laughs> uh, so, as is the case with these texts, they're actually writing about historical material conditions that are modern, modernity. They take time to be translated. They are then read in a context that is increasingly postmodern, and therefore actually a lot of what they're talking about in terms of historical material conditions becomes kind of obscured. But anyway, so that's one of the, sideways, that's one of the big texts, um, 100 Years of Solitude. I did, I don't think I've mentioned, I did do a talk recently for the Canterbury Socialist Society called uh, Solitude or Solidarity, and I'm going to reuse that kind of um, juxtaposition again later on in this talk um, but in that talk it's on YouTube I have like particular readings from a lot of these texts that I find to be really illustrative of what I'm talking about I don't think I really have time to go into the books unfortunately tonight um, but again in 100 Years of Solitude it's a book that's often talked about as introducing these ideas of multi-narrativity so lots of stories happening at the same time and again, that's where Ferris in that first quote kind of said, oh, you might have some doubts as to who to believe or what kind of story you want to accept. And again, Life of Pi is a great one where it's um, commercialised that to shit. Um, but actually, the story is about the gaslighting of a population through colonisation um, and they're losing any kind of grasp on material reality through colonisation. There's, uh, in 1928, in real life, there was a thing called the Banana Massacre in a town called Sienaga, um, where the United Fruit Company basically were unhappy with their striking workers and they brought the Colombian government in to support them to suppress workers. And we don't still know how many people died because there's, there's no evidence of it. Again, this is a kind of the, the making unreal of things that have actually happened. Um, but this occurs in the book um, and the train is a really important motif in that and you'll see that I've deliberately kind of reproduced that through the images that I've used. Um, but yeah, so it talks about people being bundled into the train dead bodies as if they were bananas and stuff, some kind of crop to be um, dumped on the sea or whatever. Um, 
But this, I guess what I'm trying to say about that is that 100 Years of Solitude is an incredible book uh, and it's much more materialist than it's given credit for, both in terms of its historical and new materialism. Um, and that's what I guess I'm trying to say about most of magical realism and post-colonial literature. You get an overemphasizing of particular kind of uh, tendencies to multi-narrativity, to indeterminacy, um, as if things, oh, what side should we take? I'm not sure, should it be the dead and striking workers? Don't know if that really happened though. Like, um, and it's actually really reactionary and that's sort of what I'm writing against. But um, what we get in the 1960s and 70s in particular is the formalization of magical realism into a kind of literary mode or a genre. Um, and that's where we start to get the codification of anyone here as like an English student um, or whatever of what we start to see technically in those texts and what makes it magical realist. Um, and that's where we come back again to that has an irreducible element of magic, details the presence of the phenomenal world, so it has realism as well. Um, again, Zamora and Ferris follow up here and they say, in magical realism, the supernatural, as it might be, sometimes it's really long lifespans, again in 100 years of solitude, Ursula Aguarin lives for just like so, so long, and it's like never part of it. <laughs> um, but that supernatural, it's not a simple or an obvious matter necessarily, but it is an ordinary matter an everyday occurrence, admitted, accepted, and integrated into the rationality and materiality of literary realism. That's good. Um, where things start to get a bit tricky is where it's then kind of taken as magical realism, what it means politically, and what, um, yeah, I guess the lesson of it is. So the most common uh, way that you'll find magical realism being rationalized in theory is that it says the narrative mode, this is Maggie Ann Bowers, she has a book called Magical Realism from 2004. It's probably the like most kind of like accessible, just like rundown, Harold Bloom style version of like the genre. Um, but she says what the narrative mode offers is a way to discuss alternative approaches to reality to that of Western philosophy. And absolutely that is the way that magical realism has been understood and valued. It's something in which the real, is always the colonial perspective or you know the uh, authoritarian powered could be masculine patriarchal version of the world as it has been now applied to gender stuff and the unreal is always um, that kind of discounted version of reality um, alternative version of reality that usually includes some kind of magic that speaks back to rationality and rationalism uh, and speaks back to empiricism and all that kind of stuff. And definitely some texts do this in a really kind of like straight up way, um, but not all of them. And there's a real kind of problematic implication to that setup um, because we have this idea that, okay, we've got these, it's binaries, and what it does is put the binaries against each other, and that's it or it resolves them into a weird kind of neoliberal third way where it's like, well, sometimes it's this and sometimes it, it's that. Um, and it's really evasive uh, as, a, as a account of what magical realism does. It's not true to what the literature does, absolutely, because the literature is always telling you to side with the people who are the most disempowered, always. And it does so through its, um, <laughs> its I guess, uh, its loyalty to matter, historical matter and vibrant matter all the time. And so what I want to tell you now is why um, I and other materialist critics of magical realism think that it and post-colonial literature has come to be understood in this way. And it has to do again with that moment in which the texts were written um, and translated and came to be part of the kind of um, publishing industry, the award industry, uh, all that kind of stuff, and to be commercialised. So if we're talking about, you know, um, 100 Years of Solitude being published in 1967, uh, it was translated into English in 1970, it got the Nobel Prize in the early 70s, um, very shortly after it was translated into English. Um, around that time, we have some really significant moments happening 
in the way that philosophy and criticism and literary criticism and cultural studies function fundamentally. And so we have the emergence of post-structuralism, which is, you know, yes, a little bit earlier, but there is always a lag time with academics. Um, and so post-structuralism really was all about responding to that orthodoxy of structuralism, this idea that there were rules for the way that languages worked, and so there were rules that would always be replicated uh, faithfully um, in terms of how meaning is created, and post-structuralism really acted against that and said like, well, no, um, this is all like kind of arbitrary, there's a lot of discursive space between signified and your signifier, what people say and what does it actually mean, there's space there for power. And so that's coming out at around this time. You also have the new physics, which is not really a scientific thing, but it more comes to describe how developments in science were understood by people, lay people. So the new physics really starting in the 60s, you had things like quantum physics, string theory, indeterminacy again is where you find this word, the idea that atoms behave differently when they're being watched, um, or all this kind of stuff. Scientists, I'm sure, would understand this stuff in, in quite particular ways, but what that meant for um, cultural critics and commentators and philosophers was again supporting this whole idea of there being a lot more contingency and indeterminacy in the world than people had thought before and again supporting this idea that we were reacting against as a moment um, the kind of meta-narratives of the past these monolithic ideas of how things had been again simultaneously you had this um, you know uh, proposition of the transition from modernity as a kind of, again, I'm going to use this, I'm going to say mode of production, I know that other people won't use that in the same way, they will mean capitalism or communism, whatever, what I mean is the kind of particular modes <laughs> of how capitalism functions, so the kind of more industrialization or the post-industrialization of post-modernity, um, so we have some real changes in the way that labour works and the way that value um, is generated, particularly here in the West, not necessarily elsewhere if it's outsourced, but the way that we engage with the economy. Um, you have the, the, the falling of the Berlin Wall, and then shortly after that in 1991, the dissolution of the Soviet Union. So this real sense that not only is communism over, but actually the dreams of Marx were over, it's post-Marxism. Everything that he you know, ever promised it, it failed to deliver. So you have all this kind of, this lack of faith, this um, sort of dashed dreams of these meta-narratives, and also the sense that, well, atoms are doing weird stuff, and also language is, is kind of all over the place, um, all this kind of stuff signaling to people that really, um, they need to start making their own choices, <laughs> um, kind of paving the way for a kind of neoliberal way of being in the world. So. There isn't really any rule anymore. Um, it's up to you. You'll be a good person. You'll have the, the wherewithal in yourself to do what you need to do. And I've mentioned third wave feminism there because unfortunately third wave feminism <laughs> happened at a time where it really um, suffered from and played it into the kind of neo the, the transition to neoliberalism. And there are reasons for that. You know, um, second wave feminism was not good. Um, but unfortunately, the moment when we finally <laughs> uh, started listening to uh, black and brown women, we only listened to the ones who said good stuff about capitalism. So, yikes. Um, anyway, <laughs> so all of this stuff happened at a time when post-colonial theory was just becoming a thing, the idea of post-colonial theory and literature. And these texts were just being translated into English and they were just receiving all this kind of praise. And so it's kind of a weird historical material kind of serendipity where we think, oh, well, they're doing all of this stuff. They're doing it all. And so this must be what post-colonial politics is. And then we look back and we can find that in parts of the history. And so there is a kind of selective bias and a blindness there in the way that we understand, you know, certainly magical realism, um, but also post-colonial literature. On a really basic level, one of the problems with the way uh, that post-colonial 
theory kind of came out of this. And again, I would point you toward the post-colonial unconscious by Neil Lazarus, which is where he's kind of riffing on Frederick Jameson there. And he talks about how post-colonial studies before the 70s didn't exist, which wasn't to say that people didn't think about post-colonial places. There just wasn't like a, a formalized field of study that did that, but afterwards it became a curious combination of post-Marxism and post-structuralism and all this kind of stuff. Um, but basically the main problem, I guess, or the most basic problem with it, as I said, is that um, what all of that means for post-colonial post theory is that it, focus on a, it focuses on a very specific experience of what it means to be colonised. Um, and that is an experience where your version of reality, uh, your philosophy, your beliefs, are problematized and discounted. And that did happen mostly to regional elites in places. There was a class stratification to the way that colonization occurred. Actually, as Neil Lazarus said, for a majority of colonized people, above all those mostly peasant members of the subaltern classes living at some removed from the administrative and increasingly urban centers of colonial power, colonialism was experienced preeminently in terms of dominance, that is, along the lines of material, physical, and economic exaction, conquest, taxation, conscription, forced labor, eviction, dispossession, etc. And again, I'm not trying to say that any experience of colonization is illegitimate. What I'm saying is that we hear about a very specific experience of colonization and that being the one that now suits the most, um, the kind of ideology of capitalism now, um, as opposed to actually the, the, the sheer violence really of the way that colonization was um, meted out across the world. So that's kind of like a basic way in which what Lazarus calls the post-colonial unconscious or these dominant accounts of magical realism and post-colonial literature do not really or are not accountable to their putative objects. But there are beyond that some really, I think quite troubling like political implications to the way that we read this kind of literature and these kind of politics. And if you just excuse me, I'm just gonna have a little drink. Anyone else can do it too. <laughs> I can do it. I just need to get in the dries and also no breath. Okay. <laughs> um, so, for me, I think that some of the implications of the way that we read magical realism and post-colonial literature and politics have real consequences for the way that we do politics now. And some of this will make more sense, again, if I had have been able to share a lot of the literature with you, and I'll do my best through Hayden and the WSS to like share things that I think are really relevant, because I um, definitely said to you that I'd give you lots to read tonight, so enjoy that. But these are the things that I find, you know, that I really want to highlight, that I find to be you know, things that people should think about. So, whereas in the history, in my opinion, of magical realism, when you read it from a materialist perspective, when you're looking at its focus on historical material conditions and also vibrant matter that come together to kind of like suggest a way to read it, um, what we have in dominant accounts of magical realism and post-colonial literature is a real, what I'm gonna call interiorization of the marvelous. So rather than it being in the world, as Carpentier said, in a kind of um, inherent in geography, demography, politics, all this kind of stuff, what we kind of, at the implication of dominant accounts of these things in politics, is that that exists in your mind, and you're a unique person, and a different person, to be able to read the world in a way where magic is apparent, and the marvellous is apparent to you. Um, and that's really problematic for a lot of reasons, because it means, first off, um, that that's not, one, uh, communicable necessarily to other people, so that's quite a burden to put on people who do see the world in a different way, to say like, well, in order for other people to be your allies, you need to, you know, communicate this entire worldview, rather than you actually sharing the world that you live in, um, that in different ways could be like that for you. It also means 
that you start to get this essentialization of what it means to be different. And what we accept in post-colonial studies of this idea that some people have an access to magic or different ways of viewing stuff, we would not accept if we were talking about gender. For example, that women have more of an access to like the magical, uh, the mystical, all that kind of rubbish, you know. They all kind of um, bolster each other and there is no essential access to any kind of account of the world. It comes through your experience of historical material conditions. Sometimes that is tied to identity, again because of historical material conditions, but you are not inborn necessarily, in my opinion, with a particular access to a particular worldview. Because that becomes an identity in these accounts, you get the real commercialization of that kind of difference and otherness. And so this playing to a particular kind of readership, which is Western and white usually, um, in English speaking, uh, to read about, again, these exotic places. And Laura Esquivel's like Water for Chocolate, um, which I kind of critiqued earlier, is a perfect example, hugely popular, where she writes recipes that are so good, um, almost as scrumptious as the leading woman, <laughs> you know, that kind of stuff. Um, it's a real kind of problem, but it's also bolstered by the publishing industry, the awards industry, and all that kind of stuff, which is again a, a kind of latent criticism that I don't really have time to get into. So further, I've talked a little bit about the difference of, you know, uh, the problem, sorry, of unintelligibility of if this is something that exists in you and not in the world, what is shared there? What is also historical about that? That actually takes away all the matter um, and all the memory, I'm going to argue, of what the, the kind of uh, historical material conditions that people face are. Um, and this is where I'm getting to the hairy end of the talk where I sort of um, started having a few beers and, <laughs> and didn't write as many notes, but hopefully um, you're on board at this point. So when I did the talk for the Canterbury Socialist Society, I talked a little bit about solitude or solidarity, um, and that was a reference to Gabriel Garcia Marquez. What I meant by that was that on the one hand, and again, um, sorry, so on the one hand, we have this idea of people not sharing a world basically together. They don't have a common language um, or a common matter, basically, or a history. <laughs> what do you do with that? I honestly don't know what you do with that. What is the uh, political imperative? Where do you even start? Um, I think that's really nihilistic and I think that that's a real danger of kind of where we are with some of our politics. It's a real stasis and it's solitude. The opposite to that is that we really forge ahead with a politics of literal solidarity. That we accept that we share a world where matter is vibrant, but it is also contained within particular historical material conditions. So it will produce certain effects but it will also act in kind of unlikely and improbable ways that hopefully we can read um, to give us that moment of the marvellous. And that's really what I guess I'm kind of like urging through this talk is to really pay attention to the matter that surrounds you. And that's kind of why I included the Christchurch um, Virgin Mary at the start. Because when I started writing my PhD, it was around the time of the earthquakes and it was a really weird time <laughs> to be around. Um, and it was a real sense of like paying attention all the time of like, was that an earthquake or was that a truck? Like, what was that? And it, it kind of created a real sensitivity um, to the world that I think is better than empathy. So all the time now we're like sort of called on to identify with or actually experience people's experiences or else we can't be true allies. And I think that's again really limiting. What we can do is experience the material world and through that have a sense of how it works. Um, and then, yeah, I think sympathy's better than empathy. Um, but what I'll just kind of sort of end with is saying that some of you might have encountered Roland Barthes, who, this is actually from the 50s, but it's a book called Mythologies. And he talks about, about the way that myth um, is what occurs when things lose the memory that they once were made. Um, they become nature or natural. And so he says, in passing from history to nature, 
Myth acts economically. It abolishes the complexity of human acts. It gives them the simplicity of essences. And again, this is highly suggestive in terms of what um, this all means for feminism and gender studies, if you have time for it. It does away with all dialectics, with any going back beyond what is immediately visible. It organises a world which is without contradictions because it is a world without depth. And if anything, I think that that is why magical realism, it is the dialectical tension in it, the holding of some contradictions, that is actually why it's quite a powerful mode um, and something that people should listen to, not only that it's kind of a stand in post-colonial stuff. Incidentally, this is a, um artwork that came out post-quake of Christchurch. This is Julia Holden. Uh, it's called High Street. And I have so many pictures that look almost exactly the same as it. And again, I mean, that's actually what it looked like. <laughs> um, so there is still a real tradition there of looking to the most basic matter that people live with to see it's different stuff. It's not the same as war. It's not the same as colonization. But we can read those histories into the way that kind of our, our conditions are made up and our, our spaces are made up. I think that might be me. <laughs> um, so yeah, thank you so much. Uh, I might need a little break for answer questions, but yeah, cool, thanks. <laughs>
about being a church Yeah, that, that book sounds really interesting. I'm gonna ask for the slides. Yeah, I wouldn't mind reading that book. Yeah. I have heard about that result, but like that's yeah. about more like, like I know that it Right. Because it's kind of part of, it's part of the whole, uh, I guess it's, a, it's kind of like the expansion pack of the French Revolution. Yeah. <laughs> you know? um, and then also, the, I don't even know that they basically got enslaved. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't like, really know. And, and, and the reason for it is because of the same structures yeah. of colonialism, and, uh, like, you know, like capitalism, capitalism basically. Like, basically, like, you know, farming, things, sugar, or whatever, and, like, just yeah. 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 like, continue to exist, and therefore the need for that labour. There's a really great, um, yeah. kind of, yeah, reminds me of this quote by uh, Lacan. Uh, like French psychoanalyst. He's not really a Marxist or anything, but it was, it was during the like uh, I think it was during the like '68 rebellion, and like someone, some people got on stage during a lecture and started like interrupting his lecture, and he was like, "All of you, you demand a new master, you'll get one." Yeah. <laughs> it's like there's so many instances of that in history. People like, yeah, want, like, like you gotta like you know overthrow the, the system. And it's like if you just end up with a new. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the Green Party. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. Like, what's going on here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I've read, I've read Bill Gokhan. But that's it from anything that was very much. Yeah. Yeah. That one sounded really good. Yeah, it's like, yeah, like the, I guess it is like, like another example of like, yeah, and I thought there were like actually continualities with, I was just say, kind of continualities with your talk on Fisher mm. in terms of that dialect between um, the historical materialist uh, reading of the literature and the neoliberal reading of the literature and, mm, 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 mm. and the foreclosing of, of potentiality. Yeah, 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 yeah. no, exactly. Yeah. Um, sorry, I'm Hayden, by the way. I don't know if we met. We have. Oh, yeah, like one of the other yeah. Okay. Um, I thought she was almost too soft. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm going to bring out a couple of questions or two, but um, what up, dog? Even there, maybe. Um, how do you think? Oh, really interesting. Yeah, mm, yeah. Mm, no, I, th- I thought she fucking. I knew she was real smart, but like, like <laughs> not like taking like a right a third of it, and then I'm just gonna freestyle the rest. Right, right. But no, I thought it was good. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Everyone's going, oh yeah, oh 
we need to get the, get the slides, circulate the slides. So, uh, no, well, what I'll do, I reckon, is we'll have to get her on the podcast. Oh, ah, yeah, yeah. And then, like, do more... Do a follow-up. Kind of yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. Um, oh, look, she's fucking ready. Are you ready for questions, guys? Okay. Are you ready for questions, are you? Try. <laughs> See what... <laughs> Was there? Yeah, she's in the right mind. Yeah, she's at stats. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Hello again. Yeah. yeah. Well, 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 well um, stats, stats, get some questions yeah. going. We'll try and sort of wrap it up in 15, 20 minutes. It depends on how immature it is. But uh, before I ask the crowd with some questions, just by the way, at the wine barrel before you hit the exit there is a sign up sheet so you can either put your name down and your email and say if you want just event updates or if you want membership info it's fine by us like i said all of our events are public they're free um but before i crack on to things as well i just wanted to give shannon a quick little gift from the society for coming up um so first of all <laughs> <laughs> Some mission savvy or Cabernet Sav for you. Oh, that's so very funny. Thank you for talking to us. And then also uh, a book. We don't do this. Called um, uh, Folk Tales of the Māori. Which I actually, the reason why I chose this book is I think it was kind of similar to some of the things you're saying tonight in terms of yeah. how like, the, like history is often told from the perspective of the elite of any society. A lot of the folk tales in this are from the, the, the lower classes in Māori society. Yeah. Great chat. And the second one is um, Frederick Jamison, Jamison's The Cultural Turn. So again, I think this is all relative to your so talk tonight. Thank you so much. So, very kind. And I'm going to ask to give another round of applause for Shannon now. <laughs> Ask the crowd for questions. So if we do have questions, please raise your hand. I know Tony did, so I'm going to ask Tony first. Um, can I Hi, Tony. Okay. Uh, Mark um, famously said that the point is not to reinterpret the world, but to change it. Yeah. How do you think he would have responded to magical realism? Well, that's um, a real... Tony asked, um, so Marx once stated, um, I think it's the 11th thesis of Fortrat, is that philosophy is to interpret, oh, hitherto philosophers interpret the world, the point is to change it. But the question flowing on from that is how do we think, or how does Shannon think Marx would interpret magical realism? Well, I think it's, it has a kind of dialectical materialism to it, and I don't think that reinterpretation and changing the world are totally different things. If we're talking from a dialectical perspective, to reinterpret things could be to then change stuff. So I don't think in that sense that it's totally... Oh, sorry, I'm not... I've got quite a loud voice, so I just don't stand in front of microphones. Could you hear that? Yeah. Probably, yeah. <laughs> um... So I actually don't think that it's that far removed from what Marx would have thought. Um, is, I think Marx would be happy at the tradition of Marxism in the post-colonial world and, and the, the fire that is put under um, the cultures who have produced magical realism or not necessarily cultures, the, the authors and, and the moments that have produced magical realism. So I'm thinking under Pinochet or you know under you know other totalitarian governments as well I think maybe quite positively about the fact that this was something um, that gave people the energy to think that the world to see how the world could be recombined you know without having to reinvent we don't need like 
I will say there's an incredible overlap between magical realism and science fiction for anyone who wants to look into that. But it's very speculative. Um, Slaughterhouse Five, best magical realist science fiction, speculative fiction book of all time, in which soap, again, a kind of like very, this is the very materialist thing, talking about soap being made out of fairies and Jews and stuff like that, and the stuff that's given to GIs. I know it's horrific, but you know, that's what's that's what it was. Um, and also, you know, watching a war movie in reverse where the bombs like were sucked up and then, um, you know, all this kind of stuff. I think that's a really powerful thing to remake the world out of what already exists. I don't know, I think I maybe evaded that question a little bit, but... <laughs> no, I thought that was, <laughs> was a good one. <laughs> cool, man. Uh, yeah. Any more questions? Yes! I kind of wrote it out because it's kind of long. So. Good. Um, <laughs> so one criticism that you mentioned of the kind of formalisation of magic realism was that it takes an idea of the kind of inherent magic in matter uh, that we could all feasibly access to an idea that certain people have access inherently and others don't. Yep. Right? Um, and that made me think about my experience of understanding some, like in the New Zealand context, like Māori art and things like that. We can kind of access it, but I as a Pākehā person have real trouble connecting and kind of yeah. understanding where that comes from because I don't have that cultural knowledge. So I'm wondering, are there sort of barriers to accessing magic realism and how do you get around those and so? I mean, there are always, and I've probably simplified things a little bit in saying that there are, you know, Arundhati Roy is a really good author who um, is super accessible, um, but she includes a lot of like, um, I want to say like Punjabi, like language and stuff. It just as one of the, the kind of um, technical conventions of magical realism is that there will often actually be a lot of non-English in it and stuff. So you do have to do a little bit of work. Like you do have to do a bit of research to understand things. But that doesn't mean that the core concept of how um, the conditions have affected people and the injustice really that comes through from it, um, that you can appreciate that. And I think that that's my criticism. Not that we should be able, that it shouldn't be hard for us to have conversations across difference in culture, and not that we shouldn't have to um, really grapple with some of our different understandings of things that you know feel more natural to us or not. But that, those differences, and again, I'm gonna, I'm gonna borrow from Vivek Chiba here, <laughs> and I'm gonna say, those differences don't go so deep as to make those worlds completely unintelligible to each other. Do you know what I mean? Um, we experience the world in different ways. We might have different languages and different concepts and stuff. And post-structuralism is not, you know, unhelpful. <laughs> These are things that can be useful. But we don't need to uh, throw the baby out with the bathwater. We have a material world that we cannot um, give up. Yeah. Yeah, that's that one. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? <laughs> that's fine with me. Oh, oh, no. <laughs> um, you mentioned Bulgakov briefly mm. at the start. Oh. And so I'm, I'm just kind of wondering how um, how he fits in and what the... Uh, you, so going from painters in Wild Republic to yeah. uh, to people writing in South America, there, there's a big gap in the timeline there. Yeah, it sounds, yeah, yeah, in the talk there was. <laughs> no, yeah, there totally was, it's a great question. Um, Master and Margarita is literally yeah. my favorite book, so yeah. I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. Um, so, and, and he's very, uh, the White Guard, very relevant right now with yeah. Ukraine in that as well. Wow, that is something I probably need to look a little bit more into, to be honest. Um, but what I will say is that um, so first off, the way that we came to, M Mikhail Volkov wrote The Master and Margarita sometime under Stalin. We don't actually know when, but the manuscript was smuggled out of Soviet Russia and published actually um, by a publisher who published a lot of, Milan Kundera, some of Milan Kundera's stuff as well, so a, a kind of emigre publisher. Um, and so that, I think, first off, is a really interesting point about how things don't just come up in people's minds around the world. Like, there are actual material roots from the experience of 
something to somewhere else. You know, I, I think that's a really good materialist way of reading the exchange, exchange of literature around the world, for one. For two, um, I think that magical realism actually has a really strong relationship with romanticism, which I didn't touch on in this talk, but it really does. Um, it's like a more, um, yeah, I guess it, it, rather than where I would say romanticism flees from history, magical realism looks it in the face. Um, and there's a real, in that novel in particular, which is about like one of the narratives is about when Jesus was crucified <laughs> um, and Pontius Pilate and I don't, I always say that in a funny way, Sam's dad always goes Pontius Pilate and I'm like, that's Pilates. And like, <laughs> I don't know, it's like that little like tweet where it's like, don't make fun of people who say stuff because they read it. Like I didn't, I didn't know, that's why I thought how you said it. Um, but they have these kind of like this dialectical relationship again. It's really part of German romanticism. There's some other stuff. What I will say, the real and the unreal stuff, is that in the Master and Margarita, the communal apartments are super weird. They're a source of magic, and there's all these like weird little like corridors and you know staircases and all this kind of stuff. And I think that's a reference to the way that. Um, Lenin kind of like did the mathematical formula for the allocation of space um, in the Soviet Union. So being like, this is how much space we have. Every person can have X square meters. And what that actually meant, so that's a rational kind of thing, what that actually meant for people's lives was that they lived this like super bizarre like existence in these like totally unreal seeming spaces. Um, there's parts of that, I guess, yeah, I think there's a lot to be said about the fact as well that something that's really interesting about The Master and Margarita is that, so this is happening in a, an atheist state where it's written. So the belief in, let's say, magic, or let's say, God. yeah, religion or whatever, mm. is outlawed. Um, and so what Volkov does is says, well, if you're going to kill Jesus, and this is the whole part of the like crucifixion tale, um, then there is no devil. Because if there's no Jesus, there's no devil. So how do you explain what we're living under now? And that is a really confronting question because even, there's all this like uh, verbal magic in it where it's like devil knows there's a devil there. He's taken over Moscow, for those who haven't read it. It's the best. And he just like disappears people and he like plants foreign currency on them and he does all this kind of stuff. It's just like so good. So there's lots of like these, it is really conjuring magic. It's a really interesting um, kind of outsider in that sense that it's got its own things. Uh, but there is a tradition. What I'll also recommend is a guy called Alexander Eckend who wrote a really good book called Warped Morning. Stories of the undead in the land of the unburied. And that's kind of stuff, uh, yeah, kind of magical, cool, realist stuff outside of literature in a particularly post-Soviet, in Soviet context. That's cool. That's so, sorry, that was really long, but I just like, I'm just like, yes, I love that book so much. <laughs> <laughs> it's the best. Cool. <laughs> okay. I've got a question. Yeah, go for it. Right. Relating to that sort of back to back to politics and also partially bring it to like what Tony asked of like the pieces of forever and when it's changed and so on. Like what do you what is what do you think is the sort of purpose of like your intervention into this? So like so your PhD writer is about Yeah what's the point of it? Like, I know like, we've all so, asked we've all asked the same question. Yeah. Don't yeah, worry. <laughs> Any PhD student, I'm sure, does yeah. confront that eventually. But like, so the the point of your intervention is like, what, like, how do you, how would you want it to be taken, like, politically and, and like materialized in the world? Like, so if we're talking about, because throughout your talk, sort of the the vibe I got was like trying to confront the difference between like particularism and universalism. Right? Yeah. So like a, like a, like post-colonialism, the way you sort of presented it, the discussion of like emphasising the particular over the... Which it should 
if this is what I'm saying to that. Really what it is, is a kind of circle jerk intervention into post-colonial literary criticism to say that when you're going to read a book, actual read it and where it comes from and how it affects a particular contemporary context and look at the historical and other matter of both or, or more of those contexts. So really it's to say that you know, these people should be doing better. Mm. So it's kind of a call for that. And that's, that's I mean, you'd be, the sad truth is you'd be asking a lot of any PhD students to do more than address critics. Mm. But <laughs> um, I think the other thing is to say that we, for me personally, this kind of stuff is really important. It's all right, I was, I have do, almost done that so many times tonight. <laughs> Uh, sorry that I called attention to it. Anyway, listen to me, everyone. Um, <laughs> I'm just really excited. <laughs> I'll take that as a compliment. <laughs> um, to hope that uh, people will find this to be accessible and to feel that like the theorising of uh, literature and stuff is for them. Like, okay, I don't know. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm Go for it. Because like what I, what I appreciate that you did is you kind of like created space for deconstruction, but then you called for a reconstruction after. But that. I also didn't really provide that. <laughs> well, you, you gave it you gave it like historical place, like you said it's not a yeah. bad thing to go through. So let me answer that and say that I believe that the moment for deconstruction is a little bit behind us now. Yes, we've all done that. I mean, we've got the wreckage upon wreckage to deal with. We need to make something from it. It's a, we can't just keep like despairing at the rubble, <laughs> you know, of things. Um, I don't think it's on necessarily me or any person to recreate that rubble so much. I think that will come out of the particular context where people are, of how, again, matter, there will be some matter that lends itself to things in a vibrant kind of way. And then we have to have the ability to direct that with good politics. So for me, that's socialist politics. And then we take the stuff that we have. I, I again, that's a really evasive answer. Someone vote for me to be in politics soon, and I'll. Uh, I promise I'll have a bit of an answer for you then. <laughs> yeah. Green, Green Party leadership's up for the. I don't want to be part of the Greens. <laughs> <laughs> um, Shannon Burns for independent. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Is there any more questions from the public? <laughs> Thank you. I really have. You've all been so, so very lovely. Thank you. Um, you have another round of applause. Thank you very much. Um, I'll just quickly mention um, how great it is to have Shannon up here from Canterbury Social Society. We also appreciate the Federation helping her get up here. Um, it's, yeah, it's an honour. Um, our next event is just a social drinks next month, but you can see that on our Facebook page. And then our next next event, um, at the end of August, I think it's the 27th of August, all of our events on a Tuesday. $2 tacos, if I didn't mention, that I'm uh, working Vega Bond before the event from 5 o'clock onwards. So, Please definitely indulge in that. But our next event is another member um, of the Wellington Social Society, Ashok. Um, he is going to be doing a um, public talk on the housing crisis, um, how we got here, and hopefully give us some um, direction, maybe not answers, but like how to organise out of it. He's also a union rep as well, so he's got a bit of an organising experience. But um, that'll be our next event in August. Um, September, we have an event from uh, a labour historian, who um, Jim McAloo, who's doing a, a talk on the origins of the Labour Party um, from 1920s to 1930s. Uh, and then after that, we have another member from the Social Society doing a talk on um, the radical left prior to the Labour Party. So it's a bit of backwards um, historical uh, discussions. But anyway, thank you all for coming. Like I said, if you want to come to our next event, we can sign up here. We can get information on the events or membership info and stuff like that. But um, yeah, thank you all for coming and um, safe travels tonight. Kahiti.